Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here at the Entrepreneurship Avenue tonight. Uh, my name is Ben Ruschen. I'm co-founder and managing director of a startup from Vienna called We Are Developers. Um, to give you a brief overview of, of what We Are Developers does is um, we've developed Europe's number one developer job platform. So when companies in Europe, whether they're startups or large corporates, want to hire developers, they basically use our platform in order to do so. Um, we provide them with a very fast, efficient, and targeted uh, channel to hire software developers that allows them to hire developers at a, at a pace that's twice as fast as, as regular job boards and in a more efficient and cost-efficient manner. So um, what I want to talk about today is startup sales. Um, I don't know how many of you have already founded a company, but um, for me, it's, it's not the first company I've started. And um, sales is always something quite tough. It's quite difficult to set up a sales team to get revenues flowing in. And obviously when you start a company um, and you get some investors money, these investors, but also you want to generate revenues and you want to generate revenues fast because the faster you generate revenues, the closer you get to kind of, you know, uh, becoming a profitable business or being able to cover your fixed costs um, without the need for, for external funding. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the kind of phases that startups go through from the founding up to the scaling and what it needs at each phase when it comes to generating revenues and making sure that your sales is as effective and efficient as possible. So um, I'm going to base this presentation on a framework um, that I was taught at Harvard Business School where I did a sales course last year, a sales leadership course. Um, it was developed by Professor Doug Chung, a guy who, who teaches sales at Harvard Business School. and um, he basically developed this model and shows that the sales process, so the way sales actually works, is influenced by a number of factors. So it's influenced by the skills that you have in the company, the skills that the sales team have, the people working in sales and acquiring new customers. It's influenced by the structures that you provide to the sales team. So the tools that you give them, whether it's technologies, whether it's frameworks, whether it's regulations, whether it's processes, um, it's also uh, defined by the compensation system, a really important and really kind of hard to get right part of sales, um, because obviously variable pay incentivizes sellers to perform and the way you define this compensation systems uh, drives their behavior. And sales is also defined by how you train, how you supervise the sales team. It's defined by or influenced by the behavior of your buyer. And all of this comes together to kind of create an outcome, which at the end of the day should be revenues. Revenues or more leads or more information about your buyer market. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the money that you're generating that's gonna be influenced by all of these things coming together. So um, let's look at the, the different phases a startup goes through. So obviously at the very beginning, you have the pre-sales phase. You found the company, you get some money from investors, you might get a government grant, and you're working on an MVP, on a minimal viable product. So you don't have a finished product yet that's ready to throw out there in the market and, and really you know, uh, sell in a large scale to your clients. So in this pre-sales phase, you should basically prepare for the time when you can actually go out there and sell a ready-made product or a product that's you know, um, something you can actually present to companies and to customers and which they can actually use. So. Um, when you're in this phase, you have to do a lot of preparatory work. So this means, how is the pricing going to be? What are your competitors' prices? How can you match these prices? It's probably a good idea to be at least at the same level as your competitors when you're new in the market and you don't have the same kind of infrastructure and product that they have. And uh, you're going to be creating fact sheets for your clients. You're going to be creating uh, landing pages that they go on. You're going to um, focus on keeping all of this stuff very, very simple. One of the experiences that I've made is that, especially in the beginning, you start to overcomplicate things. You start to think that the sales material or um, the sales messages, the marketing has to be very complex, very detailed, et cetera. You have to keep it as simple as possible, not just in the first phase, but throughout the entire sales cycle in phase two, phase three, and phase four as well. Um, obviously, one of the very important things is that you conduct market research. So you really need to see what's the price level, what are customers willing to pay, what's the learned behavior of clients, does your product fulfill these behaviors? Um, even though you're kind of trying to disrupt the market, are you giving something to your new clients or preparing something for your new clients that they already feel comfortable using? 
So these are kind of the things to consider in the phase when you're preparing to go out there and sell. Um, phase two is your MVP is ready. So you have like something that's beginning to look like a product. And that's when you really need to try to get all your buddies, get all your connections from the companies you're already networking with together and find some friendly customers who are willing to test out the product, who are willing to um, you know, help you work out your sales pitch and get to where you want to be once you can actually start selling the, uh, the product. Um, what I found is that in this phase, obviously, a lot of stuff isn't working yet. A lot of stuff hasn't been established. You might not have the interfaces your customers want. You might not have integrations with other software that they have. So what's really important in the beginning, be flexible, um, understand their needs, and be prepared to uh, make compromises in order to get some nice customers on board that will later become your testimonials. So um, phase three is you have a product, right? Your product is ready or the first step is ready. And um, after you've been kind of selling on your own as a founder, because that's, that's kind of what you have to do at the very beginning, you're kind of selling the stuff um, by yourself, you hire the first sales rep. So this is a really important phase, I think, in every com company. For us, it was once we could afford our first uh, seller is um, find someone who's really suitable for your company. Um, ideally, someone who has experience in your market, who has experience with the product you're trying to sell, and then you really need to spend time with them. The worst thing you can do is hire a seller, um, give them a fact sheet, talk to them about a product for a day, and then you let them go out there and, and they're just not doing what they should be doing. So um, what I really recommend is spend a lot of time with this person, coach them, um, let them shadow you for the first one or two months. Let them join every single sales meeting that you have with the client. Um, have a lot of discussions with them. Make sure that they really that they're able to sell the product in their sleep, ideally. And um, then it's time to once your once your sales rep also really understands the product, it's time to start clustering your clients. So obviously, you probably have thousands or tens of thousands or just a couple hundred possible clients for your company. You need to cluster them by revenue potential. So typically it's the A, B, C, D clustering. A is the companies with the highest revenue potential and C or D are the companies, the smaller companies with the lower revenue potential. Um, what I recommend to startups is that you focus on both the large customers, so kind of the fat whales, the customers that can, are gonna have the, a very high average deal size, but at the same time focus on the small, um, low revenue customers. Why? because most of the time the customers with the large average deal size are the ones that have the longest sales cycle. So um, at We Are Developers, for example, when we acquire a very large customer that might make up 10 times or 20 times the revenue of a small customer, this can take six months, it can take nine months, it can, it can take more than a year. And um, in order to make sure that you have ongoing cash flow, ongoing liquidity coming in, in the time when you're working on the large fat whales, you need to make sure that you have a lot of small customers because they're easy to close. It might take a week or two or a couple of weeks, um, but this will ensure that you have an ongoing cash flow. At the same time, once you have a product ready, you need to start working on your sales structures. And what I mean by this, I'm going to show you on the next slide. So what's really important is to standardize stuff. So when you're preparing to hire a sales team, you're going to have three, four, five, ten sales reps out there selling stuff. You want to make sure they're aligned with your product. You want to make sure they're aligned with your strategy, with the messages, and with the ideal sales process. So what you do is you write up a call script. You write up a, a script for uh, your sales team, how they have to approach clients. What's the ideal messages? What are the arguments? What are the figures? What are the USPs of your product to allow them to really sell the product at their best potential? Obviously, you as a founder can do this yourself, but you need to make sure that the others can do it just as well or almost as well as you can. So having something like an onboarding document for new salespeople so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time, um, a little sales handbook allowing them to really understand the product features. How does your product compete with other products out there in the market? Um, building up a knowledge base um, is something I really recommend. So having one kind of place um, on your internal platform that you use to communicate with your team that really has the single source of truth. So how many users do you have? Uh, what is your pricing? What are your features? When is which feature going to be launched? This is stuff everybody has to be communicating the same message and has to be communicating the truth to the customers out there. So this is really important. 
then you'll have to start preparing sales tools. So obviously in the beginning, a lot of people start with an Excel sheet or a Google sheet or whatever, um, where you list your customers, who are the contacts, what are the emails, what are the phone numbers, et cetera. But once you start having hundreds or thousands of customers, you're not gonna be able to work with an Excel sheet. So you'll have to have a CRM tool. Um, this could be Pipedrive in the very beginning, which is a very simple CRM tool. Um, it could be HubSpot, which is something that we are developers uses to, to really track which salesperson is working on which customer, what is the success, which sales stage are they in? Are they, um, are they working on a new, new lead? Are they working on an existing lead? Has an offer been sent to the client? Has an offer been signed or declined? This is the place where you really know what's going on at the moment. Um, then you'll need B2B marketing tools. So HubSpot is not just a CRM tool, but also a B2B marketing tool. Um, you'll need tools like LinkedIn Sales Navigator or Prospect.io in order to really understand, um, in order to really understand who your customers are and how to reach them better. Um, what I recommend is having some routines like Monday kickoff meetings, Friday review meetings, having a one-to-one -one with each sales rep, aligning the product and sales teams, and also implementing OKRs, quarterly sales goals, to make sure that your, your sales team is performing on a quarterly basis and continuously delivering the results that you need. So um, this is just an example of, of HubSpot. Um, this is uh, displaying the different sales cycles that you have um, from discovery, qualified, confirming, decision-making, closing a deal. So it gives you a nice overview of who is working on which client, and HubSpot, tools like HubSpot also allow you to have sales analytics so you can really see which salesperson has done how many calls per day and really have transparency in what your sales team is doing. Um, yeah, once you have these sales tools in place, you're ready to hire a sales team. Um, so you'll obviously need a head of sales, which is something very challenging, something that can take a lot of time. You need to be very careful about making this decision um, because this person at the end of the day really defines whether you're going to be successful or not be successful uh, in your entire sales operations. Um, what's important is to really identify who are the people you need to work in, their com in your company. How do you identify people? Which companies do you hire people from who really understand your product, understand your market, and know how to do sales? Um, I think we're, we're kind of running out of time. Um, is that correct? Okay, Benjamin. Yes? I have one question from the audience yeah. for you. Sure. So um, it, it's related to the core tasks of the, um, of the team, um, of the core team. Uh, so would you suggest sticking um, to the essential functions such as sales and marketing for the core team and get external, he like external help or additional help for customer service? Or would you rather say to keep all the main functions within the core team in the beginning? I would keep or them in the core team. Help? I would keep them in the core team. So I would keep uh, customer service or account management or customer success, whatever you want to call it, uh, within the sales team because it's part of being successful in sales is um, once you've acquired a customer that you're taking good care of them and kind of uh, adapting to their needs and giving them what they want and, and providing a good customer service. So this is something I would not outsource. I think you can outsource things such as research, um, pre-sales, so having external people kind of go out there and figure out what are the companies that um, fulfill your criteria and creating lists for you, um, finding out the contact details of the key people that you want to target. That's something you can outsource. Um, but the core sales and the core customer service is something you need to keep in-house. Now I have another question for you. Um, how do you find out what the customer really wants? So um, the suggestion was um, showing the MVP and asking questions, or do you have other suggestions for that? Um, one thing is really having conversations with your target clients. So um, for us, the target customers are CTOs and head of recruiting. Um, so what we do is we meet people that we know um, already who are going to give us very honest feedback on our product. Um, we try to have very informal dialogues, but we also send out questionnaires to customers to figure out what they want. Um, and what we're also doing is focus groups with, with target clients to really understand their behaviors, what they like about the product, what they don't like, what we need to adapt. So I would try out different methods. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for all the insights. It was really helpful and interesting. 
So for our participants, um, now it's time for another networking session. Um, so please go to the exhibition area and join our startup partners and you can chat with them, click on the tables and feel free to try it out. See you later. Bye. Bye, see you, thanks.